my mic on? Yes. Okay, can everybody hear me? All right, excellent. If, it, if at any point I get quiet, which has never happened to me ever, but if it does, let me know. I know there were some mic issues yesterday. Okay, so good morning, everybody. Really happy to be here. Um, I already had some caffeine this morning, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be ready to go. Hopefully everybody's ready to go. So I'm going to be talking today about the advances in uh, the genetic diagnosis of ataxia and what we're doing now to be able to achieve a better diagnosis. And I'm going to build on some of the themes that were uh, raised yesterday, and I'm going uh, to show you how this all ties together. So by the end of it, everybody here is going to be a genetics expert. Ready? Okay. All right. So here's my, my disclaimer. Uh, for my disclosures, I just want to point out that I'm in an academic institution that uh, does diagnostic clinical exome sequencing, but I just want to point out that I receive no financial benefit from that. So I'm going to talk about it, but there's no financial relationship there with anybody else. Okay, so before I delve into the genetics, what I just want to illustrate, I want to remind everybody that ataxia is a symptom. It's not the actual disease. And so why is this important? Why do I always say this every time I give a talk? Because the word ataxia tells you what's going on, but it doesn't tell you anything about what's causing it. It doesn't tell you how severe it is. It doesn't tell you what the prognosis of that is. And the analogy I like to give is so you, 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 get, you have a cough. You go to the doctor and you have this cough and you wonder, why do I have this cough? Well, there's a lot of reasons. You could have a cold. You could have the flu. It's, you know, we're getting at the end of flu season. You could have pneumonia. You could have tuberculosis. You know, you might even have Ebola, okay? And I made this slide, by the way, before Ebola was a thing that people got. But, um, but these are all very, very different in terms of how you treat them and how severe they are and what happens if you leave them alone. So you wouldn't go to your doctor and you wouldn't say, you leave the office going, oh, I have a cough. You'd want to know why. It's the same thing with ataxia. We want to know why because it makes a difference. Okay, and this is why it makes a difference because there's a lot of things that cause ataxia. And Dr. Paulson touched on this yesterday and I'm just going to reiterate it now. So we have acquired causes of ataxia, which is pretty much anything you can think of. Um, we have genetic causes, which I'm going to get into in glorious detail in a little bit. We have uh, what we call idiopathic, meaning we don't know why people get it. And my personal opinion on that is there is no such thing, that these are really either acquired or genetic causes we don't yet understand, and that this circle is actually really part of these other two. But, you know, we're gonna get, we'll, get, we'll get there. And again, the thing I want to emphasize is sporadic ataxia just means unexpected. It can be anything. It can be acquired. It can be genetic. It can be anything. So sporadic ataxia doesn't necessarily put you in any category. And remember, ataxia is common. About 1 in 5,000 people in the world have ataxia. And half of them have a genetic ataxia. That's 1 in 10,000 people, which is equivalent to ALS. Okay, so this is why awareness is so important because this affects a lot of people. Okay, so how do we manage ataxia? So we heard that great talk yesterday from Dr. Kamani who illustrated how ataxia patients need to be managed a special way. You need care teams. You need special things for ataxia patients. I'm going to take that a step further. I'm going to show you why. Here's the traditional medical approach. You have a bunch of people who have a similar thing. Let's say ataxia. The way it, uh, doctors used to approach this is you say, okay, well, they all have the same symptom. They probably all have the same, same cause. We'll give them all the same diagnosis and we will treat everybody the same way. So everybody in the audience knows that doesn't work. Okay? So here's where genetics helps because what we're discovering now is that there are these diagnoses and ataxia is, uh, is, is one of these where genetic disease hides. People will get a diagnosis of these things and these are like multiple sclerosis, cerebral palsy and ataxia and they're, and, but we could get a specific diagnosis for them if we knew the genetics. So why is that important? Okay, so if you have these same patients and now 
they all have individual specific diagnoses, specific causes, a specific gene. They ha instead of having one big diagnosis, they have three separate diagnoses. And what this means is this means individualized treatment. And the term that we're using for this, which you may be hearing now, is called precision health. Essentially, we're it's individualized treatment for a specific person based on their specific diagnosis. And this, these involve things like particular treatment, surveillance for particular con uh, conditions or comorbidities that may be unique to their disease, counseling and psychosocial benefits that are specific to them, not necessarily just everyone, and disease modification or cure. We're, it's unlikely that we're going to have a magic bullet that's going to cure everyone. And we heard a great example yesterday from Dr. Zogby about treatments specific for SCA1 that are in development. The same idea. You need to know that specific diagnosis to get to this point. Okay, so now how many genes are there? Well, we heard in a couple of talks yesterday, people were talking about oh, 100 ataxia genes. And I'm going to show you similar numbers, but those are the ones that are the, are the primary ataxia. They cause ataxia, and that's pretty much all they do. If you look at every genetic disease that could potentially give you ataxia one way or another, that number goes as high as 680 genes. That's a lot to think about. Okay, I mean, I, I deal with genetic ataxias all, all the time, and even I can only remember about 620 of them. Um, and they break into all the categories. There's about 400 recessives, just over 200 dominants, and all, all other manner of, of conditions. And we still can't diagnose everybody. So that means there's genes that we still don't know about, that we still have to find. This gets complicated. Okay, so now we're going to teach everybody about genetics. So these are, are, are your genes. You have 23 pairs of chromosomes. You get half of them from dad, half of them from mom. And I'm, this, the only things I want to take you, you to take away from this are these key points. What's a gene? A gene is a basic unit of inheritance. Basically, a gene codes for a thing. So one feature, or in our case, we think about diseases, one disease from a gene. Okay, chromosomes are genes all lined up in a row. We have 23 pairs of them, and the word genome, which is we're going to hear a lot of, is basically all the DNA, all the chromosomes within a person. Okay, so just again to illustrate how this works, you have mom and dad, and, and, the, the, and, and the child gets half the DNA from each of them. Okay, so let's go quick review of the primary uh, ataxias. So there's the dominant ataxias, and what does that mean? So dominant ataxias mean you need one damaged copy of a gene to get the disease. And so those are usually inherited parent to child. So if you lay a family tree out, what you'll see is you'll see the disease go generation to generation to generation. And at this point, we're up to 43 distinct dominant ataxias, primary ataxias, and these are typically called the SCAs or the spinocerebellar ataxias. Now, um, typically they come on later in life. They don't always, so you can't use that as a rule, but typically between the ages of 20 and 50, and they affect about four per 100,000 worldwide. And again, it's one copy of the gene, so that means if you have an affected person, they have a 50% chance of any of their children getting the disease. Now, the most common of these are the ones that we always hear about, SCA3, SCA1, SCA2, SCA6, and SCA7. And if you add those all up, that's roughly about half of all the dominant primary ataxia. So if we see a family come in and their family tree looks like the one I just showed you, there's a 50% chance it's going to be one of these. If it's not, then the other 50% are about 400 other genes. 
So to give you an idea about how discovery is going, here are the genes that have been discovered in the last three years. So, and I've, al I've also listed uh, what, where the patients who were diagnosed with it come from. And the reason for doing that is I want to illustrate this is a worldwide problem. So in 2014, four new genes were discovered, SCA 21, 34, 38, and 40. In 2015, SCA 41, which I'm going to talk about uh, in a little bit because that was, um, that was one of the ones that my lab, in, co in collaboration with uh, Esther Becker's lab at University of Oxford, reported. Um, SCA 42, and uh, last year, SCA 43 was reported. So discovery continues at a very rapid clip, and new genes every, every year from all over the world. Now, the recessive ataxias are a little bit different. Now, there's no great nomenclature system yet for the recessive ataxias. Now, more recently, the newer ones are being called spinocerebellar ataxia recessives, or SCARs, uh, with a number. So uh, that can get a little confusing, SCA number, SCAR number, but we manage. And again, they look very similar. The difference here now is because you need two damaged copies of a gene. So what normally happens is in your family, there's no ataxia, no ataxia, no ataxia, and then in one generation you'll see multiple kids with, with the condition because they're inheriting one damaged copy from dad, one damaged copy from mom. Okay. And at this point, depending on how you define this, there's maybe about 40 primary ataxias that are recessive. People could argue about that number, but that's a number I like to throw out there. So, to, so just to re-illustrate this again, each parent has one damaged copy, and having one damaged copy makes you a carrier. You don't really have the disease, but you can pass it on if you marry another carrier. So in this case, uh, out of four kids, one of them will get both copies and will be affected. And so that's a 25% chance of passing it on. Now, the most common of the recessives and the most common uh, genetic ataxia overall is Friedrich ataxia. And that's roughly about half. As we discover more and more of these, this number is going to go down. Now, typically, the thinking was that the recessive ataxias happen in kids because a lot of times they come on very early in life. But as we're getting better and better at diagnosing this, we're now seeing this is happening later and later with milder and milder forms. And there's about as many of these as there are of the dominants. Now, the most recently identified ones are up here. These are the last three years. So in 2014, we had SCAR 17, 20, and 23. In 2015, we had SCAR 19 and 21. And last year, we had SCAR 22 and SCAR 24. So again, these are from all over the world, as you can see. And they're continuing to get developed or discovered every year. Okay, so how do we test for these? So there's a lot of different genetic tests out there. So when you say you're getting a genetic test, what does that mean? Okay, these are some of the different kinds. So there's full gene sequencing. Now I'm going to talk about the way that it was typically done because this is still being done. So this test may still be ordered. It's a very comprehensive test, but on a per gene basis, it's the most expensive. Uh, you can identify new mutations, but you have to remember that just having a sequence change doesn't mean it's causing the disease. There's a thing called targeted mutation analysis. Essentially, this is very helpful in families with a known condition. You can look just for that specific mutation, and it's a lot cheaper than doing, than doing this. Okay, but remember, if it's negative, it only means you only are negative for that specific mutation. Then there's repeat expansion testing, which you have to do if you're thinking about the, the most common SCAs or Friedrichs. And these won't find sequence changes. They'll only find the repeats. So this is getting complicated. So then there's, then there's tests where you combine them all together. And the term, the term we use for that are panels. You can combine the gene sequencing, the mutation analysis. You could combine repeat expansion all together. But when you put all these things together, you can get something that's fairly expensive. And the problem is you have to know what you're testing for. Because even though some of these things use, use names like comprehensive or complete, they don't test every gene because we don't know all the genes. Not every Every gene has a test that works by these methods, and some genes only cause ataxia sometimes, so they're not included. So how do we, how do we get around this? So 
here's, here's, here's what I want to pose, is that genetic testing, is when you look at our testing just for small sets of things, there's an inherent bias there. So if you're looking for the needle in a haystack, do you grab a handful of hay and look for anything sharp? Is that the best way to do it? Or should you take the entire haystack and look, look for the needle? I actually had to look for it there. See, that was hard. Um, so what's, what's the best way to do it? And so I'm going, to sh- I'm, going to, I'm going to show you how we avoid some of these problems. So the caveat to doing sets of genes is that there's a bias because the diseases don't read the books. They don't know what they're supposed to look like. So how do you know that the presentation of a common, is, is, is the presentation of a common disease, classic presentation, or it's a variant presentation of something rare that's been reported totally differently? You don't know. How do you know what the whole range extent of a disease is if it's only been reported in one or two families? How do you know what it looks like in everyone? And I'm not going to go through these, but here are examples of diseases that can look entirely different in different families. This is getting confusing. How do you avoid these, stra- these, these problems and do the best genetic testing to get the most efficient diagnosis? Okay, so now we're going to jump in to, uh, to next generation sequencing. The genome has three billion bases. If you want to think about what that means, think about a book with, th- with three billion letters. That's a pretty big book. Now, we, we focus on, on something called the exome, which basically is the protein coding part of the genome. It's only about 30 million bases, so it sounds much smaller if you first say th- uh, 3 billion. So uh, that's why I say that first. And the genome contains 20,000 genes. And the coding region of all 20,000 genes is represented in the exome. It's only 1% of the genome. It's much easier to look at. Now, because we look at all of the genes at the same time, we're not biased because we're now saying whatever shows up is going to show up. We're not focused on this gene or that gene looking for changes there. We're seeing whatever changes come up to the surface that make the most sense for the diagnosis. And looking broadly across neurologic disease, this has now been in use for several years, the overall diagnostic rate across all neurologic disease is roughly about 25% uh, in patients that you suspect have a genetic diagnosis. Now I'm going to show you how that applies to ataxia. Now, what we're seeing right now is since exome sequencing was introduced, there's been a massive rise in publications uh, with diagnosing uh, ataxia. And it's gotten to about 100 papers per year. And And that's holding steady right now. Now, how can we apply this? Okay, so this is a, this is a, this is a graph showing uh, when genetic disease arises. So typically, there's a peak of genetic disease in children, and then there's a peak in later adulthood. And what the thinking has been traditionally is these are single genes, and these are combinations of genes, and that genetic testing will not help in that population. So, but now that we have this technology, we can actually look. So in the, in the kids, it's suspected there's, that they're going to be genetic, and that's what we see. We can diagnose up to half of, of kids with genetic conditions using this technology, and that's what you'd expect because you'd expect it to be genetic. But what about the adults? Most ataxia patients live over here. So what's the rate? Well, the rate is actually 20 to 40 percent. It's much higher than you would think. The single genes are actually causing quite a bit of this. So this is very, very useful in making a final diagnosis. So let's talk about the tests that are available using this technology. So the term that you may hear is whole exome sequencing. Now, it gets confusing because sometimes that's also called a clinical exome. You might hear me call it a clinical exome. Now, this is the most complete test. It covers all 20,000 genes in the genome. It's the most expensive overall, but it can still be cheaper than the panels, maybe about five or $10,000. But it's the least expensive per gene. It can be as cheap as 25 cents per gene. Now, there's other versions of this. 
there's panels. And because this technology can sequence a lot of genes at one time, these panels have a lot of genes on them. They could have a few or they could have hundreds, 600, 700, 800, 1,000. They're less expensive than the tradi traditional panels I told you about. But the problem is it's not the same as an exome because you're not testing all 20,000 genes. Now, you have to know what's being tested because sometimes these panels are called exome panels or sometimes they'll be called clinical exomes because they're panels of clinical clinical genes. So you, have to, so you have to ask the question, what exactly is being tested here? And sometimes there are some laboratories that will do a panel of a small set of genes and then reflex to a whole exome if it comes back negative. The interpretation of these is a little bit different. That's why I make that distinction. Now the other thing is when you look at this, when you're looking at 20,000 genes, figuring out which one is causing the disease is challenging. So not every laboratory looks at them the same way. So laboratory A may look at them one way, laboratory B may look at them a different way. So it's possible you can get a diagnosis from one laboratory and not another one. The great thing is when you do this sequencing, the sequencing's done. You never have to do it again because all the sequencing of all 20,000 genes is known and it's not going to change. But you have to remember the method doesn't find repeat expansions and the key thing is having a sequence change doesn't mean it's a disease. Because everybody in this room, the reason we're not all the same person is because little tiny changes all through our genome make us unique. So not everything causes a disease. Okay, so how does this work? What test is the best? So there's been a number of papers that have looked at different ways of using this technology. So one way is you can do a panel, a very focused panel of a few genes. And here's one paper that looked at this in uh, patients that were presumed to have a genetic ataxia. And it gave a pretty good diagnostic rate, almost about 20%. That's great. That means one in five patients walk in the door, they can get a diagnosis with this. Okay, can we get that number better? All right, well here is a panel where you take all 20,000 genes and then you select a specific set that you think of a few hundred genes that you think may cause ataxia. And now the number is almost twice as high. That's great, now we're getting better. Okay, what if we now look at the whole exome, look at all 20,000 genes, and now here are patients who all that, all that happened was their doctor checked the word ataxia as a symptom. Now that's not necessarily as good. You can see there's a difference here. Here's 13% in one study and 44% in another study. It means how well did the doctor know that they had a, an ataxia versus, you know, it was just one of a whole list of symptoms they checked. Okay, well what if you focus on ataxia patients and you have an ataxia doctor say for sure you have a, a ataxia and we think it's genetic. Okay, there's a number of studies, including one from our group, uh, that have looked, at, have looked at this question. And you can see the numbers range from about 20% all the way up to nearly 50%, depending on the population that you're looking at. And it doesn't matter if there's a taxi in the family or not. We looked primarily at adults who had sporadic ataxia, and we got a very high rate of diagnosis. And it can be a little higher if you look in kids and you have a family history but it's still high no matter who you look at. So if, you, so if patients have been evaluated for every possible cause of ataxia and there's nothing left, there's a good chance that we can get a genetic diagnosis using these technologies. But now people are trying different strategies. Here's a recent paper that looked at only 25% of the exome, about 5,000 genes. They look at that first doing a panel approach and then when, if that comes back negative, they then broaden it and look at all 5,000 genes. And that gave a really good percentage too. So the bottom line is we don't know the best way to use this technology yet. Uh, I tend to favor the exome approach if you can do a very comprehensive analysis of all 20,000 genes, which is what we do. Uh, but there may, be, there may be other ways to do this that may be more efficient. So this is getting better and better and better. And these numbers are fantastic. There's no genetic test that's ever existed before where you could take all comers and potentially diagnose anywhere from a fifth to a half of them. That is unheard of. This is a dramatic change in uh, diagnosis. So what has this done for, for ataxia? So it's helped us redefine 
what the diseases look like and make better diagnoses. So here I'm going to give you one example. Hereditary spastic paraplegias are a class of conditions that are characterized by spasticity of the lower extremity and weakness. They may have ataxia, they may not have ataxia. They're considered an entirely separate class of genes with hun- or, or, or of diseases with hundreds of their own genes. And so they're called SPGs, just like we have SCAs, they have SPGs, and they're up to SPG 77. So they put all their recessives and dominants together. Now here's one called SPG7. It's 12% of the, of the recessive HSPs in the world. However, we're now seeing this in ataxia patients using whole exome studies. And in fact, in one study in Canada, 40% of the, of the ataxia patients had mutations in SPG7. And um, so this is different. This is something we did not know. We did not know that SPG7 could look like an ataxia. We didn't know it until we started doing these types of tests. Here's another one. This, was, well, this one's SPG39. It was identified in 2008 as a spastic paraplegia. But in 2014, it was shown that these very specific forms of ataxia that may have endocrine or visual problems, or some that even just are pure cerebellar ataxias, our response, uh, this gene is actually responsible. So now we're seeing a blurring of these distinctions where these, uh, where these uh, diseases are all blending together. And the way we sort through it is by looking at the entire genome. Okay, so let me give you ex- another example of how we can identify brand new conditions. So for example, here's a patient that we saw at UCLA, a 40-year-old gentleman, two years progressive uh, ataxia. He had some cerebellar atrophy on his MRI, and we'd worked him up extensively, and we were not able to find any cause for his condition. Now, we did exome sequencing on him, and he had a variant in a gene called TRPC3, and we were very interested in that because this is the pathway within the cerebellum that TRPC3 operates in. And I'm not going to go through this right now because my time is going to expire in a minute and I'm going to turn into a pumpkin. But, um, ba- but basically this was very important because if you take a look, I've now circled every other gene in this pathway that causes an SCA. We have SCA6, we have SCA2, we have a number of different conditions here. We have a protein here that's a target for antibodies in a certain acquired uh, ataxia. So so it made sense for this to actually be a mutation. And we did, some, and we did um, uh, biochemical and molecular studies which demonstrated that this was actually a causative gene, and this was named SCA41 recently. But we would not have been able to identify this without this technology. Okay, so the last one, and this is the one, uh, one I really want to emphasize because this is the real power. This is the real power of this test. This is a nine-year-old girl who developed ataxia at the age of two. She basically, for all intents and purposes, looked like she had Friedrich ataxia, except she was a little bit young for that. And of course, she was genetically negative for that and for everything else. So we did exome sequencing on her, and she had a known mutation in a very unexpected gene. It was a gene that was associated with the genetic form of ALS. It caused something called brown violetto van Leer syndrome, which is a combination of motor neuron disease, so ALS, um, deafness, and ataxia. And the thing about this is it's a fatal disease. And normally when kids get to be her age, they're, they, are, they, already, they already died. And so this was very atypical and this was very unexpected. Now this is caused by a mutation in a vitamin transport protein. So the thing that we, that we knew about this is that this protein was defective, but it wasn't absent, and she already had a mild form of this. So we thought, what if we gave her high dose of the vitamin, and the vitamin in this case is riboflavin, and we gave her high dose of, of riboflavin. When she came to see us, she was about to go into a wheelchair. That was really the reason that they came to see us, was because they wanted, they wanted, something, they wanted to try something before she was unable to walk. And here's what happened. We gave her the treatment and she immediately stabilized. Uh, We started her on a very intensive exercise and physical therapy program. It's now been over four years later. She's mildly clumsy, but she's playing volleyball, she's dancing, she's cheerleading, she can run five miles. She is essentially cured. And this would not have been possible. We never would have thought of this gene before ever. Now this is an absolute home run. This is not going to be every single patient. We've, We've sequenced about 
400 patients with ataxia right now, and we have maybe two cases where this fits. And so this is not everyone yet. Okay, this is, this is what I hope that specific diagnoses will bring us to a point where we can tailor treatment to specific individuals and achieve great outcomes like this. All right, this is the, what, what has me doing this every single day is that we can potentially fix someone. Okay, so just to finish, this is, what, this is essentially what we do. We do comprehensive evaluations of patients. We assess them for common genes. If that's all negative, we don't find an acquired cause, we don't find a common genetic cause, this is where we go to this genomic testing. And it can be very, very effective by at looking at these massive amounts of genes and fine-tuning it to a specific diagnosis. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to run out of time. I'm going to try to just take like a minute or two more and just to emphasize this. So why is this important? This is the, this is the, um, uh, the course of disease, basically from cause to disability. And so why is getting a specific diagnosis important? Well, so number one, if we know that the ataxia is due to a genetic cause, we can stop unnecessary testing. We can stop doing studies that aren't going to help, to help anything because we know what the cause is. The other key thing is that we can give someone an answer for why this is happening. This is time to diagnosis. So this is from symptom onset to when a diagnosis is reached. And this is not to scale. There are people out in the audience who have gone decades without reaching a diagnosis. And this can go on forever. And so ending that diagnostic odyssey is what this type of testing can do. And lastly, we, if we know what people have, what the cause is, we can get to treatments. And we can tell people what this means for their future and potentially for their children's future. Okay, so I, I'm not talking about the future of testing, I'm talking about the presence, present of testing. So essentially, we have exome sequencing, we can look at 20,000 genes at a time, it's a cheap and efficient way of making a diagnosis. We can apply this broadly to complicated diseases like ataxia. We can actually make diagnoses that change how we manage patients, so this is clinically meaningful. We can spare patients this long odyssey of trying to reach a diagnosis, and we can spare the cost of going through this redundant testing just with one simple test. Now, this doesn't replace all the other evaluations. It needs to be used in conjunction. You need doctors that know how to use this. People have to be trained to use this properly, and this is what we're doing. This is where medicine is going. And the results aren't going to necessarily be positive or negative. There's going to be gray zones. I haven't even talked about variants of uncertain significance, which some of you may have, 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 have been told. But there's disease-specific interpretation involved, and so there's a whole new paradigm coming of how this testing is going to be used to make diagnoses. But this is the first step, and I'm introducing you to it. This is the future. Okay, and uh, now I've uh, completely extensively gone over time, but everybody else was early yesterday, so I'm just taking their time from yesterday. Okay, so this is, these are just my thank yous. Um, I definitely want to thank all the patients and their families who have contributed to our work and the work of our collaborators, because without you, none of this would be possible. So thank you, thank you. Thank you. There's going to be a question and answer session later, so please, if you have questions, write them down. I'll be happy to answer them all, and thank you very much for listening.